I'm a director of digital strategy, and what on earth does that mean inside Microsoft? It, I spend most of my day job working, working with boardrooms of big companies, trying to help them understand what on earth Microsoft technology means for their shareholders. It's kind of the summary of it. So I'm a, I'm a management consultant, but I'm also an engineer, and I'm a sort of a hybrid of that, trying to sort of make that conversation work in that environment. I've called this transformation in a new era of AI. Um, and I'm really, really exercised about the transformation element of this. If you were coming here today, God help you, hoping for a bit of deeper insight on generative pre-trained transformer models and how they rock an incredibly clever way of doing attention inside unstructured text. That's not me, I'm, I'm pleased to say. Um, but if you, wanna, if you want an insight on how this kind of technology is currently being used to disrupt business models, operational models, and even employee engagement models in some of the, the biggest companies around the world. Well, hopefully I will be able to shed a little bit of a light on that. I've got a little bit of a bias in my editorial on this because I spend most of my time currently in retail and consumer goods. So a lot of the examples I'm gonna give you are, have probably got that flavor. But by extension, you'll very quickly be able to see how they stretch uh, across the wider, the wider world. Um, in a room full of athletes, I thought I'd begin with a story about running shoes. Um, and this story is, it's really the, the moment the light went on for me about how powerful, uh, how disruptive this technology is. Um, it's a story that I'm slightly latching onto because actually most of the work behind this story was done by a brilliant colleague of mine. And it took place probably just over 12 months ago. So in the, the early bits of 2023, when we were experiencing the beginnings of the wave of the next generation of, of GPT. Um, as a colleague of mine that was, had privileged access to what ultimately became Copilot, and we'll talk about that in a minute, um, but also had been spending a fair amount of time playing with OpenAI's models directly. And he, he wondered what would happen if you used all of this technology to develop a new product launch inside an organization. And amongst everything that he chose, he just decided, I'm gonna launch a running shoe. But it's not just gonna be any running shoe, it's gonna be the best running shoe you could possibly buy. So he used GPT-3 to search the internet to find what were the top six best reviewed running shoes. And then he used the same model again to reason through those answers to identify the top characteristics that had made them the top six reviewed running shoes. And then he synthesized that together and put that back into GPT-3 and said, so what would that running shoe look like? Both descriptively and also, as you can see here, courtesy of a model by Dali, actually on an image basis as well. Slightly underwhelming with all of that build up, but it's, it's <laughs> clearly a running shoe, but understand that this is the best running shoe. In that process of identifying what makes up the best running shoe, all of the data and all of the returns that he's getting from his interrogation of GPT-3, he then throws into Word and use the beginnings of Copilot to synthesize that into a full technical product description of this shoe. Because it's quite detailed in its technical description, he found it actually relatively easy to extract that in a tabular form and put it into Excel and then ask Excel to create a business case for how much that would cost and based on some assumptions around pricing and margins and various other additional costs in the supply chain, was able to show what the business case of this product would be at a particular price point. Um, he was feeling more and more confident about all of the work that he was doing and imagined that he was then gonna take this product to a boardroom to pitch it to get that hard earned product development investment that he was then gonna need. So he threw all of this material into PowerPoint and used Copilot in PowerPoint to create a lavish boardroom presentation of this product. 
Um, he told me slightly, slightly tongue in cheek afterwards that the whole thing took two and a half hours. Oh, well, welcome to the world of generative AI. Um, it is, it's astonishing, it, it, genuinely. And there are many people that are probably going around similar environments like this, waving their arms and talking in terms of game-changing moments and things like that. Um, let me say, for, for someone that has worked in technology for most of their career, this is, this is a moment in time. It is a significant moment in time. Um, whether it's up there with cloud, um, I don't know. But it is something that will set how we live and work. It will prompt us to think about lots of challenges and ethics and concerns about data in this. And as a society, we will have to have the discernment and the education to be able to navigate some of this complexity as well. It is a, it is a very big moment in time. So having settled the room, and you all look absolutely terrified at this point here. It, it gets better. It gets more uplifting as we go through. Let's, let's, let's kind of compose ourselves and realize that actually this isn't, this isn't all brand new. This is stuff that we've, we've experienced over time um, and therefore have developed ways of navigating a lot of the problems associated with this technology. Um, AI has broadly been around ever since computing began in, in various senses. We, we, probably right back in the 50s, they were calling it things like expert systems. Um, they're, they're recipes for using processing and automation to break down steps and problems and then applying technology to think that through. And it, it feels very much like intelligence because it is that, that deductive way that, that we think as human beings. Um, and what's happened between the birth of AI in the 50s to where we are now is a combination of throwing more and more powerful silicon and capacity but also more and more powerful data and mathematics at it as well. Um, and we've transitioned through things like machine learning, where we're not having to train those expert systems as much. We're allowing the systems to understand and become an expert in their own right, to deep learning, to using neural networks, things that replicate the way that we think with our neurons in our heads, and layering and layering and deepening the depth of those models and all of the time applying more and more sophisticated insights from a mathematical point of view. To the point at which we've, we've introduced generative AI. Um, and I think there's two really important things that help you kind of understand what the shift has been with generative AI. Generative AI is immense at having a very, very good natural language interface with you because of its ability to understand the context of what you're talking about, the communication with generative AI is much more intuitive. It's much more, much, much more empathetic. It understands a lot about you. Alex, we were talking about prompts earlier. Those, that information that you're giving generative AI is really, really important because it provides the Gen AI with that context. A lot of people talk about their relationship with things like Copilot and, and, and other forms of Gen AI as being that relationship that you might have as a manager with a really junior employee. If you were to delegate a task to somebody that really didn't know that much about what they were trying to do, what instructions would you give that person? What, what would help them really understand more about what it was that you were after and perhaps what you are going to then do with that as well. And that's, that's part of our general discourse as human beings, and that's why it is so beguiling. But a lot of the power that's sitting inside this technology, both in that natural language interface, but also in its ability to then reason over the data sets that you're, you're, you're applying it to, is this incredible ability to reason over data in a really, really expansive and rich way understanding intuitively what you really meant to ask it and then returning something that is very, very close to that slightly woolly question that you asked at the beginning. Um, one of the analogies I use a lot in uh, non-technical environments, every time I put this slide up, I, 
It terrifies me to think that there are deep data scientists in the room who probably think that I am I'm so underplaying their brilliance here. But the shift is, imagine you're walking through a maze and you come to any junction in that maze. Um, our traditional probabilistic forms of AI, our predictive pattern identifying forms of AI, will probably give you an informed guess, estimate, of whether it's better to turn left or right. That guess will be incredibly accurate, might have a really, really high confidence at that point in time that turning left at this junction is the right thing to do. But it might be a junction where actually you could get to the you could get to the center either turning left or right at this point, but the routes are slightly different. What generative AI enables you to do is effectively to see the entire maze, to understand that yes, you could turn left there, but if you go right, I know that that's a slightly more direct way of getting to the goal that you want to get to. And if you think, hold that in your heads about that that's the big shift really in terms of the use cases that you would then want to apply this technology to, that's where we are with this, and that's where, where you get to um, with, uh, with the thing. Um, just a quick reflection on the breathlessness of this. And yes, there is a, a very compressed story back to the beginnings of GPT-3 back in November 22. Um, I think the question really is, where do you think we'll be in 12 months from now? If we continue at that pace, uh, every, every quarter new models are really being produced at the moment. Uh, and there are increasing developments of what have initially been large language models into small language models using the same reasoning and, uh, and, and science behind the, the technology, but applying them very deeply and richly in smaller boxes. So this technology is, is developing incredibly fast in a little bit of a feedback loop. Because it drives innovation so much more rapidly, that timeline is going to be increasingly compressed as we move forward with this new technology. And I suppose what I'm saying behind that is, is that try and build the discernment and the understanding around this technology as quick as you can because that bus is moving very, very quickly through here. And if you are interested in securing the long-term competitive advantage, the long-term value of the capital that is invested in your businesses, in the face of significant competition that this technology will drive, you should be trying to understand and make sense of this technology as quickly as possible. <clears throat> Again, slight worry on people's faces, but um, let's, let's bring this to life a little bit. Um, a quick story before I then give you a bit of structure, perhaps to, to navigate your way through the use cases that sit inside this space. Um, I, was, uh, I was on stage at a marketing conference about six months ago, four months ago, um, over in a building very much like this, populated by media marketing type people. Uh, lots of incredibly uh, excited and energized marketeers in the audience. And I was giving a bit of an explainer at that point about gen generative AI. Um, and I was, I was really fortunate to have alongside me a, 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 an expert that ran a demo as I was talking through what was happening. And I've just taken a couple of clips of that demo to give you a bit of something to look at while I elaborate the story. Um, but the demo that we created and presented to this audience um, took a typical retail e-commerce website, in this case, travel, travel e-commerce. And it took a customer through a traditional e-commerce decision tree. The premise was, was that the customer would come onto the website and say, I want to go on holiday, can you guide me towards the right choice? And they might, the decision tree might ask questions like, do you want to go somewhere warm? Do you want an active holiday? Is it just you or is it a group? Uh, all of these different questions that would navigate them down through to a buying choice. And that buying choice would ultimately be optimized as a win-win 
a win for the customer in terms of a personalized package for them to, to, to buy, but also for the travel company, optimizing the margins and the returns of the product that they were selling. And what happens in the demo is, is that the content is presented to them and the images alongside those contents are helping them click on the right options as they go through that decision tree. And in this room, in this audience, are typically the people that have created that beautiful, beguiling copy and the enticing images that are going to navigate them through to that correct choice. Um, and they're proud of that. And this audience are also very good at data. They also understand that sitting underneath this, there is a customer insights platform that is enabling some of the decision tree weightings to be tweaked and optimized according to the buying preferences of that individual. And they also know that they can test on these sites. They can do A-B testing, effectively taking 80% of the web traffic through the standard decision tree and maybe 20% through a decision tree that they're testing, a B tree as opposed to the A. I'm, I'm laboring this a little bit because the demo that I did required none of that. None of the copy, none of the imagery was pre-populated at all. It was all generated by generative AI according to the interactions of the consumer as they went through the website. And because it was not pre-populated, because it didn't have to be made beforehand, we weren't restricted to A, B testing. We could do A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I testing, taking them through however many decision trees we wanted to test at that point. And each encounter through each of those decision trees, developing insights and data associated with all of the interactions with that, that content. I've also now got a room of 500 marketeers that are looking at each other thinking, that was my job. <laughs> and it's quite leveling, particularly when towards the end of it, we were showboating, I think is probably the best thing to do. We did a little bit of an improv and we asked anybody to suggest where they'd like to go on holiday and some smart aleck in row three suggested Mars. <coughs> and the copy and the imagery was created perfectly for a hiking holiday in Mars. What happened in the room was also quite interesting because that slight crushing disappointment of the fact that their jobs were disappearing quite quickly was met <coughs> relatively quickly by the realization that actually maybe writing all that copy and imagery wasn't really as exciting as it used to be. And don't get me started on all of the brand guideline restrictions on the imagery that sits inside the dam and and how I've always wanted to do something a little bit more creative than this. They realized that actually their job was, because it had been automated, was actually perhaps not quite as spontaneous and creative as it used to be. But look at all of the data and the insights and the understanding and the ability for them to develop new hypotheses and inferences and to test new ideas in some of these outlying versions of this decision tree. That was what their careers were going to become. I'm stretching this quite far. There is nothing like this out there at the moment yet. You would have to be pretty, pretty confident about your control over the copy and the imagery that you're putting out into environments like this. But think where we're going to be in 12 months' time as we build more confidence, as we build better control and governance over our data and our understanding of the interactions with our customers. So let me, let me try and bring this to some structure for you so that you can kind of navigate what on earth is happening at the moment. I'm going to counter through this as quick as I can. Um, there are four main buckets of use cases that are really out there at the moment. Um, firstly is content generation, and you saw that both in terms of the copy and the imagery in that last example. Um, then there is a huge uh, area of interest around summarization 
about taking lots of existing corpuses of, of copy and, and content and synthesizing them down into summaries that are very relevant to the context of the question. Um, there's also a lot of use around democratizing uh, sophisticated software development, making people that are probably average coders like myself look very good, enabling them to develop code in, uh, in, a, in an incredibly supported environment. And then there is the, the probably the, the stuff that we're more used to when we go and interrogate ChatGPT online and Bing chat, how, how we sort of search for, how it changes the way that we search uh, these big public repositories. Also remember that most of the time, and you're going to hear a lot more about things like multimodal as we, as we develop this technology, none of these technologies, none of these groupings are being used discreetly in their own right. When they become wrapped up in a business application, an internal application of them, you're bolting in lots of other things. You may be working across a couple of these pillars at the same time, but you also might be produce, in, introducing traditional AI in there and, and various bits of data science in there as well. So don't think that you're just going to be using naked large language models across your organization. There's a lot more richness that sits around there that gives you these use cases. Okay, so... Some quick examples to leave some sort of memories inside here. Um, and I thought I'd start with ketchup. Um, so this is Kraft Heinz. Uh, Kraft Heinz, back in uh, late 21, ran this campaign on billboards. I think they ran some TV ads as well. And what they were playing on was basically the idea that certainly in, uh, in a good part of the world, when people were asked, draw a picture of a ketchup bottle, People naturally drew bottles of Heinz ketchup bottles. That brand pro pro prominence was so significant. Why would anybody think about buying any other bottle? That was the premise. Incredibly successful campaign. Um, and then with the advent of generative AI, what comes next actually seems pretty natural. love this. I, I, genuinely, I love this. This fills me with joy, but partly because it's some very, very clever use of generative AI, but it is also a lot of human creativity in there as well. There's, there's, there, has, there is still a really important role for the creative in our world. Think of how this started with the bottom of that ketchup bottle that looks like the light of Hal in 2001 Space Odyssey, which is the soundtrack that you're hearing in the background as well. That's, um, that's not Gen AI. That's a creative sitting on a beanbag in some room going, hey, let's do that. that um, but, but Gen AI has stretched that power of creativity. It's enabled them to test a hypothesis incredibly cheaply and quickly and then run with it. You're seeing lots of this at the moment. This is actually quite a safe way for consumer goods companies particularly to get out there. They've got real control over what they're putting out there. So Coca-Cola doing use of Gen AI, asking people to invent new flavors and, uh, and recipes and things like that for their product. And um, it drives a lot, of, a lot of interest on the back of uh, ChatGPT. Um, summarization, slightly, apologies, slightly Microsoft corporate video this one. I'll, I'll probably cut it off if I think it goes on a little bit too much for you. But this is a really good example of, of how, um, how retail companies are using this technology to drive some of that really powerful summarization. 
Car buying is a big decision. It's the second largest thing a person will do after buying a home. CarMax disrupted the industry by bringing honesty and transparency. We have tens of thousands of cars on our website or through our app. And without talking to a human being, customers can get overwhelmed. The challenge that we had was that we only could create so much content. There's manual effort, there's research, the writing, there's the proofreading. Our writers can only produce so much content a month. It would have taken them years to produce enough pages to be relevant. Azure OpenAI service allows us to summarize all of the customer reviews and put it in a, a simple to read and understandable sentence. We're able to take content and feedback from a lot of other customers, curate it, and create this very tailored content for a specific car. Through the fine tuning process, we're at 80% of the content goes through without a human needing to be involved. We're estimating an individual would take 11 years to do what OpenAI service has done in days. We have seen a significant increase in our search engine optimization. Now, the editorial team, they're able to focus their time on the areas most beneficial to the company and to our customers. There's so much possibility with OpenAI service. We're innovating at a scale, at a pace like never before. It's going to change everything we do. So some really key things in there. And as I, every time I listen to that, it kind of it resonates with lots of the language I hear on a day-to-day -day basis of how some of my customers are using this at the moment. Um, this is Azure OpenAI service. So this is actually quite a technical deployment of this inside your kind of your AI environment in, in Microsoft's cloud. So it's not Copilot. But what they're doing is they're wrapping that naked access to large language models and putting it into an application that they're using internally to deploy some great insights to their customers. Um, there's lots of integration in there. So the ability for it even to connect into some of their SEO work that they're doing so that they can weight the way that they're using these descriptions to drive extra traffic to their websites. And, and understanding what all of that means from a consumer experience point of view is, is in there as well. But a really interesting observation that they're making at the end, and granted it is corporate and it was probably scripted a little bit, but you hear this a lot about the fact that this is totally transforming the speed of innovation at the moment. We were talking outside earlier about the fact that what's happening is because this is so compelling to non-technical people in organizations at the moment, they are demanding in innovation much more readily than they used to when these innovations were much more technical and opaque. So CMOs are badgering CIOs all the time at the moment to say, I want to do this. Why can't I do this? And that is creating more and more energy and pace in those innovation processes. Um, just gonna quickly gloss over this one because I'm, I'm not gonna pretend that I am a software developer in any shape or form, but I have a go. And things like um, GitHub Copilot really enable you to, uh, to to develop your coding and pretend at least that your, co your coding is, is A-grade coding all the way. So what you're seeing here is, is that you're seeing interacting through uh, natural language descriptions that you're putting into the line of, uh, of text on the screen and it's developing the code underneath it. Um, you're also able to interact with a little chat copilot interface on the left asking questions, interrogating questions about the code that's sitting in there. Checking to see whether it's secure, for instance. Are the, you know, does the way that it's, it's handling passwords effectively, are, is that in line with our security policies, et cetera? Um, and a lot of this software then has to go through a fairly extensive workflow around testing and, and summarization and publishing of notebooks and things like that. All of that now is being offloaded from, from developers enabling the really good developers to focus on incredibly good routines that they can put in, and also um, slightly democratizing the ability of coders to be able to do more coding, perhaps over and above where they would have got to before. Um, so that kind of thing is, is really, really popular at the moment. And then finally, just to get down to um, some of the sort of the, the kind of the the, the more semantic search type interfaces that you're going to see transforming our retail e-commerce sites. This is, uh, this is ASOS's really current app that they've, they've put out. It's only come out in the last month. Um, but it, you know, if you're going to go on to ASOS and buy a little black dress on, on ASOS, 
you're not going to be using sort of traditionally kind of index search on that anymore. You're going to be much more conversational and give a little bit more about the context of, you know, it's for a birthday party or, or whatever. And it, and it will interact with you in a much more natural language uh, type, um, type dress. Um, so you've got, uh, you know, probably a lot, uh, you know, a lot, a lot richer in there that is also, as well as informing the particular purchase that they're making at that point in time, these are in, they're enriching the customer data that's sitting in the customer data platform underneath as well, because you can understand a lot more about the sentiment and the, you know, the type of person that's interacting with this as well. So, so think about those four boxes there. And then finally, well, I just wanted to talk a little bit Microsoft on here, is, is that what does a big company like Microsoft do with it? What are Microsoft's use cases for this? We have products. And one of our biggest products is things like Microsoft 365. But we have a whole raft of software as a service products that sit alongside that as well. And when, when generative AI hits our products, we call it Copilot. That is our, that's our brand. So you'll see that everywhere. Well, straight to the top. Never going down. Don't wait for the drop. Stand still, that's the motto. Yeah. Brand new bands for the auto. Foot to the ground, full throttle, big energy for the night, light lotto. Y'all talk lots, never this quiet, life like a Seinfeld plot. Mm. Ball full of songs, all of them bombs, something like a minefield guy. Boom. Get it, get it, tickets running out quick. Bet it, bet it, never get it out big. Said it, said it, never had a shout it. They said I couldn't ever do it, okay, how's it? Fit a week worth of work in a minute. Machine well oiled, you know how I stay efficient. To do this written, I do this different. Hold up, wait a minute, I ain't finished. Okay. Look, flows the same, the same, the same, the same now. Paved the way, the snakes and fakes are chased out. Back to back to back, I changed the pace now. Had to stack the cash until the bank's out. Straight to the top, never going down, don't wait for the drop. Um, it's amazing. I mean, and if you've, anyone played with it yet, used it yet? Um, yeah, a few. Um, transforms what you do every day. I couldn't do my job now without it. Can I say that? I, I, well, I, I would be, yeah, I'd be winging it anyway. But, but Copilot helps me generate images for PowerPoint a lot. I use that a lot. Uh, I just want an image about something to underlie it. I can, you know, I've got so, so much ability to do that. And again, imagine that that's backed up to your brand guideline control over your DAM as well. So you, can, you know that those images are, are correct. Teams, Teams is the space for Copilot, the way that you meet, you summarize meetings, you make up for the fact that you missed the beginning of the meeting. Uh, that whole introduction thing at the beginning about, you know, uh, that guy, that guy Steve over there, what, what did he say his, his title was at the beginning? Yeah, Copilot will just tell you what, what his title was and all of, all of that kind of stuff. It's incredibly enriching along the way. Um, so Copilot is everywhere and will be everywhere. All Microsoft apps, whether they are the Microsoft 365 apps or they're things like Dynamics. We're going to look at some stuff in Dynamics in a moment. We're going to look at some stuff in Power BI. All of your Microsoft apps will have, if they don't have already, Copilot interactions in them. That's hugely important for us. And just to sort of think, you know, think about what Microsoft's strategy is with this, we've got our Copilots, which are on the left hand, very left hand side of this but we also want you to make our co-pilots your co-pilots. So there is the ability through Copilot Studio for you to tweak those co-pilots to make them more relevant to your business. Um, we then also want you to use things like our Azure OpenAI service to make your own co-pilots. Start from scratch and just use a different way in those different business workflows, those line of business processes that you have inside your companies. Fill your boots, make your co-pilots. That's what we want you to do. And then by working with partners and partners like Delaware and, and lots of ISVs around, uh, around the world, is to build that network of brilliance out there that can use this generative AI technology to make real business impact. Um, and just to pick up on the strap line of that co-pilot video at the beginning of it. The key thing with this is it is moving so fast. Challenge yourself. Are you ready to really do this? Because it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen very quickly. Um, and if you don't keep up with it, uh, your competitors might just do. <laughs>